Greetings and welcome to another episode of the Owlings Podcast Project. My name is Martin Wilsey and I'm your host. Tonight, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I'll let Jeffrey tell you about it. Well, we're going to do some hocus pocus abracadabra. We're going to build a magic system. We're going to build it from scratch. No preconceptions, no formal ideas, no holes barred. So, guys, first, let me ask you a question. Is there a cost to the magic, and what would it be? I like having costs to magic systems because it creates cost division, and that is interesting to me. So I, I, I would support having a cost. What do you guys think? What do you mean by cost, though? Are we talking about a monetary cost? Or are we talking well, about a cost? About, you know, uh, for instance, you cast a spell and uh, you're, you're kind of drained. You can only cast so many spells unless you have a power source or something. Right. I mean, that would be like the confessors in uh, Sort of Truth. Confessor can get you to be totally obsessed, but then they have to take a rest spell. Um, or mana. Some like gaming systems will find a thing called mana where you have a mana balance and you, you can go through the ba mana balance and it regenerates slowly. Um, those are two type weighting systems. I mean, maybe we can think of some other ones. So I'm going to throw one at you. Tattoos. Tattoos, yeah. That's a very cool magic system. Uh, you know, it essentially checks on your arm. Boom, 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 boom. And then, uh, you know, you can use so many of them, like, uh, like a spell arm that uh, just sort of counts down and then comes back up. Very cool idea. Yeah, like preloaded in advance by an entire coven as they're doing right. it to imbibe power into it as you can spend later. Right, right. Yeah. Or yeah. crystals. You could have crystals. I got to load up more crystals to get my spell uh, casting up. I think what you're saying um, in a nutshell is does the magic come from being uh, from, come from learning it, from studying it, or does the magic come from a substance that needs to be traded or needs to be acquired? Right, like ammo. Yeah. Um, I think that's right. a really interesting difference. Right. Yeah. So you know, you can have a consumable item that you know you have to charge or whatever, right. or it could come out of your person, and you yeah. end up doing magic, and then you're really super hungry, or right? Something like that. So I prefer the substance because of what I said before. I think it creates interesting class division um, components to your world building, but also because it sort of avoids the trope of like sending someone away to a boarding school to learn about the magic, you know, right. like Harry Potter and a bunch of them. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, so that, that's why I think that's a more interesting. Well, I mean, I, I, the Metachlorian concept that we have in Star Wars. Oh, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's. A, that's pushing the limits of, of what you want. That, 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 point is when they, that, that was like trying to switch it from being something that was a learned magic to a substance magic. And that did not mm -hmm. work because we had mm -hmm. camp come into that series. Yeah. Um, and by the way, for people who don't know, I think we should, we should maybe explain this. So the force in Star Wars um, up until the prequel uh, movies was something that we, we understood to be um, a force that you that you study, that you learn, and that through discipline you you hone your skill in manipulating it. And then uh, new movies, the prequel movies, prequel introduced movies. an idea that the force was uh, made up of what do you say again? Metaphorians. Yes. Yeah. Right, and and became more of a substance, uh, which just really messed around with a lot of. Uh, the, the themes, the spiritual side, I don't know, it, it didn't really work for a lot of people, yeah, as right. you can see. <laughs> right. And then the, the third set of movies, they kind of pushed away from that and went back to more about training. Uh, Let's not talk about Star Wars. How about yeah, that? this is not about back Star to magic Wars. system. That, well, so we yeah. decide whether magic's going to cost the wielder or not. Yeah, does it yes. cost? We, I, I think mean, we I, do yes. think, I do think the, the, the Confessor is a perfect uh, concept of that, where the confessor can cast the magic, but then is drained for a good few hours and needs protection. Um, 
if you've played any D&D, you know that uh, you have only so many spell slots and then boom, you can't do that until you have a nice long rest. Um, you run out. Um, so I think we all agree there should be a cost system, uh, what it would be, whether it be mana or something that needs to be recharged. Uh, I think that seems to be what we want. I think I think this whole this whole thing so far is just totally not original enough. Okay. I, I you know okay. I think that it's been done a, a ton of times. We should come up with something wickedly original. Yeah, because we've already put references to what these things are coming from. What if? What if? Uh, I mean, the techno mages from Babylon or from the crusade project. The, the... I don't want to reference anything. I want it to be no. absolutely original. Let's well, what I'm saying something there, original. What I'm saying there though, is just that what if the magic is technology? The magic is literally just stuff that future civilizations developed, but is so beyond our knowledge, seems like magic. That's, that's nano though. I want, I want magic. Yeah, I want real magic. Fair enough. I want something that um, is inexplicable by technology. Something right. that, you know, um, by, let's just, you know, wild ass guesses. Let's, you know, something that um, uh, somebody accidentally stumbles on how to uh, set power from an alternate universe. And then, yeah. And they start using it regularly, you know, it's something easy. They can light candles, you know, by thinking of how to do it. And then eventually they start ramping it up. And suddenly this guy realizes, hey, I can tap a lot of power from this alternate universe. Right. And then in the end, he realizes he has no idea what he's doing to the other universe. Or, and that's a really good idea. Or we could do it this way. What if? You can tap into the quantum vacuum and pull all that vacuum energy out. And it seems limitless. But what you don't know is you're causing the universe to expand even faster and come to heat death even faster. And you're expanding those voids. Magic. Every time you do it. You're, you're being a physicist again. Yeah. Or magic. <laughs> magic. Oh, well, okay. But uh, hey, pulling from another universe, that's kind of physics anyway. Um, but... Uh, Magic can go in a lot of ways. And one of the things I wanted to talk about is not just where power comes from, which I think we've kind of done maybe to death, but what are some of the cool skills that we could give a magician? Something like, I mean, fire, it's been done. Levitation, it's been done. Invisibility, it's been done. What's a cool skill that we could have magical? I don't want to get into like the, the earth, air, fire, water, houses of magic, because... That's been done ad infinitum. Absolutely. You know, I mean, right. and heart. Come on, no, heart's not a magic. <laughs> you know, the earth, uh, you know, the planet, okay, planet Earth, whatever it's called. But anyway, um, so well, well, let's think of some things. Let's think of some things that are just. So I, I had, a, had an outline that I never wrote. And um, within that, there was um, a character who realized that he could rapidly learn languages. And it was his magic skill. And, but the thing is, is the more complex the language he was trying to learn, the worse it would give him a headache. Uh, he could learn it oh. fast, but the faster he learned it, the worse the headache was. And, um, and the farther away the language was from his native language, the worse it got, the more it cost him. Right. And, and then one day he realizes that suddenly he has this really horrible headache because his dog is trying to tell him something. Ah, and yeah. he starts understanding that there's archers hiding in the rocks outside his cabin. Um, right. So, I mean, there's, there's other original magics that you can actually um, talk about to actually... Uh, what, what would be some magic effect that could be a really great plot device? Right, yeah. I'm a little confused then, because I see, I see like something like unique as that being more like a power, like a superhero almost kind of power. Like some superheroes have x-ray vision, right? And some have, you know, super strength and levitation or whatever. But for me, I thought magic was a lot more 
you know, un undefined. You know, you can you can manipulate it to do many different things, not not necessarily just like a, a singular power. You don't think like flying is magic? I think I mean I think it's a I think they're interchangeable to a degree when you come to something like have, having uh, that kind of power. Like one person has that kind of power, or a carpet has that kind of power. But I don't know. I, I always thought magic was more you could do anything with it so long as you were expert enough in it. Mm. So the master of magic systems is probably Brandon Sanderson. And all of his magic systems are interesting because they have an inherent logic to them. Mm. Uh, they're almost like a science for how to, how to accomplish magical things using the rules of whatever magic system he's set up. Um, so to me, that's kind of what a magic system is. Otherwise, you get uh, the typical TV magic, um, where magic could do anything that the screenwriter wants it to do mm -hmm. at a given time. And the, the wonderful thing about Sanderson's magic systems is they aren't like that. The characters have magic, they have knowledge, they have skills on how to use that magic, but there's things that they can't do. Well, it sounds to me like we do like the learned magic. We don't want it to be preeminent. We don't want it to be prenatal. We want it to be learned that you have to draft those skills. Well, I also want it to be wild and woolly. Meaning, yeah. Um, Untrained and still magically able. What does right. that mean? Uh, for instance, magic is a language and there's all kinds of different guilds who know different parts of the language, but none of them are talking to each other and they're all fighting to their, to their advantage or something. Right? So, you know, one, one guild knows how to use magic and to draw on mana, let's say, more effectively than, than say, another uh, guild. But none of them are sharing with each other. So they have the same underlying magic system, but they're all using it in different ways. So now... Conflict between magic users with different capabilities. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, and that would be sort of like uh, one is uh, maybe, well, we're gonna go to fire, for instance. One is the fire specialty guild, another is um, underworld. Air, air, earth, fire, you know. Yeah, well, underworld though, that doesn't, that's new. Underworld, it's like uh, necromancy, uh, that could be a guild. Um, the electricity. Because uh, magic systems don't usually incorporate electricity. That is somewhat novel, but sometimes they do. Um, and, and various stuff like that. Uh, I, um, I did have another point I was going to make. But I mean, the guild system is a good one. Uh, I so also like the magic premise using alchemy. Ah, uh, yes. It's, uh, alchemy is like science of magic. And right. As long as you have the right materials and the right know-how um you can uh do the thing right um, well it's kind of like lots of potential plot points in there about you know hey i found a book <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh next and thing you know recipes clarity yeah. ensues mm -hmm. well the book with recipes that's a fascinating element of of magic because if you had all these magical recipes, what could you do? I know that uh, one of the stories I wrote, uh, I had this book of blood magic, magic that you had to use blood to do. It didn't necessarily mean your own blood, but it, it had to, every spell in the book incorporated blood. One of them was singularity, where you could literally make yourself a dot and it would get you out of any situation. It wasn't true invisibility, you were there, but you were just a dot. Um, so the, the, there are things that you can do to tweak it, but I will say that that magic system that I developed, it didn't have the, it didn't have the, uh, a true mana system. It, it just sort of, you had the power because you learned it and there was no real cost to it. Yeah, the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant used the concept of uh, blood as fuel for magic. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the villains in the, in the story um never use their own blood <laughs> right yeah so we, we may have blood magic system i mean i think we'll have guilds guilds of blood 
Also, Magic the Gathering had the concept of, uh, you know, being able to fire off spells, uh, but in order to power them, you had to connect them to some kind of um, mana source. And of course, theirs were typically geographical, but they don't have to be, right? Right. Yeah, certainly, and and but you could have regions, regions where one type of spell is common versus another, uh, regions where dialects are spoken of magic, and, and having dialects in their magic that might actually be very interesting, um, in terms of uh, uh, let's say air, and uh, some air spells are wispy winds. Some of them are more tornado-y. I mean, you could have all that kind of nuance in terms of regional dialects. What do you guys think of uh, magic capabilities bestowed upon characters by deities? Ah. That's interesting. Almost like uh, uh, Hellenistic, Odo, right. Greek demigod kind of thing going on there. Um, I like that. Yeah. All the better if the, if the deity is not so moral. Yeah, and they do it to teach them a lesson. Oh, oh yeah. you think you can make the world better? Go right. ahead and try. Right. I'm going oh, on okay. vacation. It may be personal. Right, right. But I usually try to keep my deities off screen. Yeah. Just... yeah. You don't typically want to focus on the deities because how would you get into their head? It's hard. Uh, and so don't bother. Uh, but we're talking about the effects of the magic. You have been presented with this magic. You can now... Uh, open any door, no matter how locked. So, I don't know if that's a really good skill, but hey, it'd be fun. Um, but uh, that kind of stuff. I mean, there's lots of magic is boundless in terms of the number of spells you could come up with. I mean, I remember heroes. Heroes. Well, that spell magic is only one category. That's it. true. You know, it's. Uh... Uh, Shay mentioned superheroes. I I consider that a kind of magic, right? You know, to be able to manipulate, you know, tell what ocean life what to do, like Aquaman. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's magic, right? Um, Strength of bending steel. I mean, that can also be telekinesis, teleportation, and all those fun little things that are psionic magic. Um, I'm actually very fond of that. I used to watch the show called The Tomorrow People. We've talked about that a bit on this show before, yeah. the three, three incarnations of it. But I'm thinking about the nice old 70s version that, uh, you know, you had these three powers, the three T's, and you could manipulate anything with your mind, which was actually kind of fun. But it's a kind of limited magic system. You could project, and projecting is a nice magic. You know, projecting a mind, projecting your mind into someone else's mind and forcing them to think something that they're not normally thinking, that is a very powerful type of magic. I think we've done more talking about magic systems than actually designing a magic system. Well, we are, we are. And so we have- That's okay. Have, yeah, no, well, no, I mean, we have okay. quite a foundation. A magic system, you gotta actually um, come up with some planks to build on. Right, and I think we have some. We say that there's gonna be a cost. We're probably going to have guilds because yeah, I think we all agreed the guilds were a nice idea. Um, they're going to be trained. You're going to learn them. Uh, so we have those things. I mean, we kind of danced around specifically what those spells would be. But uh, I think uh, we do have some elements of what we would expect. Now it would be a matter of fleshing out the details. Like, what would those guilds be? What would their specializations be? What are some of the dialects that might exist? In magic and potions and, and all that kind of stuff as well. So, um, I mean, I can propose that, uh, like I say, necromancy. Necromancy is a fascinating one. Make zombies with necromancy. I still don't think we have a magic system. Yeah, that's that's still not a, original enough. Not well. Maybe you know, the whole point of this podcast is that it's very hard to create a magic system. <laughs> it's original. It's original. Have you done before? Especially if you have four people that you have to well agree on. Have, have you guys ever created a magic system for any of your stories? Yes. Oh, well, I have. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I okay. Just so, Dave, them. tell me about your magic system. Okay. 
This one or the one that I the one that I created? The one that you created. Uh, the okay, the one that I created. Um, I had different types of ways that people could basically draw on mana. Uh, some were more effective than others. Uh, I had different levels of magic users and um, different capabilities that they could exhibit at the different levels. However, learning to do the magic was something that they had to learn. Uh, it wasn't so much spells as it was learning to manipulate the magic. Um, I also had, at the lowest level, the concept of talents, where somebody had a capability. It wasn't something that they cast or anything. It was something that was intrinsic to them. So it might be super speed or super strength or the ability to um, empathize with animals and, and sometimes control them. But it was a talent, and it was the only talent that they had. Mm. Magical. So you had some people that had some capabilities like that. Um, I also had the concept of um, different ways in which the, uh, the folks could, could fight. Uh, for instance, uh, bubbling each other was something that mages could do. Mm -hmm. So if you were fighting another mage and you guys are throwing fireballs at each other and everything, um, you could put a force field around the other mage and then suck all the air out. And if he was strong enough, he would break the bubble and survive. And if he wasn't, uh, he suffocated. So that was another way to sneak up on a mage um, and kill him. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and it was also something that uh, there was a genetic uh, component to actually having mage skills. Um, and there was a lot of... Uh, it was basically a society in which the, the the top mages were so powerful that basically they ruled a continent. Right. Uh, yeah, lots of good plot um, that's capability a there for uh, creating castes, thumbs, and mm -hmm. um, yeah. things like that. So I designed it with the idea that there could be lots of different conflict. Um, that basically, if you were an alpha, the the top category of mage. Um, then you were basically one of the ruling elite. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I, I had some things like uh, um, healers. Uh, some healers actually had healing blood, meaning if you if you actually took some of their blood and put it on a cut, it would heal you. Um, well, those healers were very much in demand. Um, if you captured one and chained them up in your basement, not only were they immortal, um, but you could transfuse their blood and, and potentially be immortal as well. So it turns out there's a whole black market economy in um, kidnapped uh, healers. Uh, it's something I haven't touched on in my stories yet, but it's, it's something I have in the works. Right. Uh, the bottom line was, again, it was a wild and woolly magic system. I, hadn't, I haven't worked out all the quirks and problems in it, but I have the overall shape of it and it shapes my entire world. That, that's the A Thousand Kingdom world, isn't it? A Thousand Kingdoms world. Mm -hmm. The reason why there are A Thousand Kingdoms is because the, the uh, ruling mages like lots of tiny little kingdoms. And they don't care if the kingdoms war with each other as long as nothing that they care about, like, say, trade, gets stopped. Right. Otherwise, they pound on somebody until the war stops. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very dystopian type fantasy world where life could be good in one place, but life could be terrible in another place. Um, and lots of inequality and thus lots of conflict for stories. And that ultimately is what I want out of a magic system too. If you have magic in your world, it's going to shape your world. Mm -hmm. It's going to shape the politics of your world. It's going to shape how governments work. Right. Our history of this earth would be much, much different if serious magic really worked. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and I will say... The weapons of mass destruction have changed politics since World War II. Mm -hmm. the Cold War. I mean, you have a magical Cold War, you can really do that. And I um, will say... Go ahead. No, I've already kind of initiated this. Does, does that answer some of your questions about magic? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I um, think I, that, you know, when I've started magic systems... I start small and then grow it out from 
a specific skill or a, a thing. Like in the one stand, um, the main character, he's, he's magically cursed and uh, he's basically immortal. And um, uh, when he gets wounded, he'll heal rapidly, but the environment around him um, gets the heat sucked out of it in order mm -hmm. to perform that. Right. And um, uh, so that was the tech technically how the magic system worked. Um, yeah, I actually like that. And um, I, so well, then it was a really um, small novella that um that i wrote that had the um uh, potential to have a much wider um uh, story associated with a, a greater expansion of the uh, magic system associated with it i guess i'll explain a, a magic system that i created too we're going to go around and, and do that um sure so um you know, in Exodus, in the Bible, with uh, with Moses and the Pharaoh and all, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, many people during that time um, did not say that you know my God is real and your God is not real. What no, they said but... was our, our both gods are real, but my God is more powerful. Right. Um, and so that that's an interesting dynamic that inspired me a little bit when I was creating a, an urban fantasy novel. Um, with many, many different uh, ordinances of different priesthoods of di to different gods. Um, and so the magic system that I built around that still had mana that was used sort of like as credit cards. Um, so if you, had, if you were able to obtain mana, either through the church or doing a good deed, or maybe you bought it, um, you could cash in that mana by doing some sort of ritual or magical act in the name of your god. But because the gods varied in their power, um, you know, the, the, the mana was the credit card and the god was the bank. So the god, you know, the more powerful god would have unlimited credit and the lesser powerful gods would not be able to do as much with the mana. Um, but maybe you served him for because you felt that, you know, his values were better or you felt that, you know, in time he would grow to be the strongest god, whatever. Everybody had their own reasons for serving their own gods. Obviously that the more powerful ones were more popular. Um, but uh, that also brought in a lot of corruption. So the very popular gods had very corrupt priests who were able to control monetarily the mana that, they, that people used to cash in. Um, and then there were, for people who did not believe in any god or didn't want to uh, be religious, there was an, uh, an outlawed type of mana called black mana um, that was illegal, but uh, was highly powerful. It didn't need any god's name in order to work um, and was charged or cashed in um, by doing various illicit things, sometimes through blood, sometimes through certain sexual acts. Um, it just, it, it brought in a lot of interesting dystopian type um, political decay, if you will, right. uh, in the world. And so it was a very, uh, anyway, I, I don't want to like say it was very cool, but to me, I thought it was a very interesting way to operate that world. And so I still have fun with that magic system. That's very cool. Bitcoin. You created Bitcoin, the magic version. <laughs> yes, I created magic Bitcoin, which is great for an urban, an urban, an urban fantasy setting. I think that's a really yeah. um, compatible type of magic system to play with. Right. Well, I mean, I might as well just finish this out with uh, the Twilight Wanderer magic system, which is uh, there's a public magic that's trained. And you go to the school and you learn it. By the time the story stops, starts. Uh, someone has a book of blood magic that I mentioned before, and the blood magic is very powerful because it allows you to mind control an entire sovereign state. And when you can control that entire sovereign state, you have a great big army. And that person that did that killed more, more or less all of the magic users. So then it just became this woman that, that a protagonist who had these skills, these very basic skills like invisibility and stuff that's run of the mill and couldn't compete until she found that book. And then she had to decide how she would use it. Use it for things like taking all of the moisture out of a room and flooding the room. Or um, as I said, the singularity spell. Or uh, I, she doesn't do the control thing, but uh, so th those are the type of things. Now, as far as the, the, the strength, no, I say taking all the water out of a room, that's as easy to do as turning yourself invisible. 
I didn't have a, a, a mana system in my, on my universe, and some people will ding me for that. But I just wanted to have magic for the sake of magic and just have magic do what it needed to do for the story. Um, but that's because I didn't think about the magic very much. It wasn't really about the magic. It was about the characters and how they developed. So, right, so we were going to develop a magic system. And we did not. And we, did not. we did not. <laughs> we talked about cost, guilds, and learned. Yeah. So I'm going to put forth an idea, and then you guys can tear it apart, add to it, or reject it. And Lay it on uh, me. We'll see what happens. Lay it on me. Uh, so basic premise, uh, fantasy world. Uh, humans may have come to the fantasy world through gates. Uh, it's kind of lost in the history as to how people got here. Uh, they weren't the first. There was some kind of vanished civilization that left artifacts. These artifacts had different kinds of runes on them, which were magic. Uh, people copied some of these runes and found out that they were able to do things with thus started a race to find runes um, to, to, to try to figure out this language of runes so that you could do things, but also to find things and make sure that your opponents didn't find things. So um, the knowledge of this language basically got separated into different guilds, houses, clans, so it's widely separated and all of the houses and clans have their own specialties, the things that they can do that nobody else can do. Uh, they're always trying to steal uh, each other's secrets. They're always trying to experiment and, and extend the language themselves or discover new things. They're always hunting for new artifacts and they're competing for finding new artifacts. Um, and they found that they can tattoo these runes onto people and uh, people who they don't have magic capability um, can use them. Uh, people with magic capability can actually manipulate the, the runes and lay them down. That's it. That's all I got. It gives me guilds, houses, some basis for society and, and how, they, how they might be fighting. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Feel free to tear it apart, add to it, do whatever you want. I don't think we need to tear it apart. I mean, I think it, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a good, it's a good staple and it's a good example of how you can take some ideas and, uh, you know, and make, make a system out of it. Um, I do think that the past civilization, which is a trope, um, okay. also yeah. works though, because it's a legitimizer. So in, in fantasy worlds, you often see like, you know, something, something powerful came from thousands and thousands of years ago to this guy that is legendary now, right? right. Um, it makes it legitimate in a way. Uh, so I think that works, but maybe, you know, if I were to try to criticize it, I would say, well, can we make that more original? Could, could we rethink maybe the past civilization and make it something we haven't seen before? But that's just a thought, right. but yeah, I don't really think we need to tear it apart. I think the past civilization thing actually works in a lot of contexts. I mean, even in science fiction, like the Forbidden Planet, um, sure, you see it is, everywhere. You know, still the plot holds up, and uh, I like the idea. Well, I mean, the beauty of this is that when it's an ancient civilization, it goes back to that something that is uh, sufficiently advanced can seem like magic, magic when maybe it was just technology. And then the question, of course, is where did they go? Yeah. You know, what happened to them? Was there a war? Is that why there's so few artifacts and cities or anything left? But I could also or see... Or like in Forbidden Planet, did one guy just get so powerful that his subconscious just killed everybody? Mm -hmm. And I could see some interesting stories about fighting to find a new artifact. Yep. A story to steal the, 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 the book of... <gasps> runes from a particular uh, clan or house or guild or whatever. Um, I, I like the idea of different classes of, of magic. Absolutely. I think this is a good good approach. I think the one thing that we're missing here is what is the what does the magic actually do? How does the magic actually become useful? How does it become powerful? Because just having magic for the sake of magic, I mean, that's 
I, I don't know. A, like fire, mind control, or necromancy, or I don't know, uh, taking all the water out of the atmosphere. I mean, what are the, some of the things that would that magic system would do that one guild focuses on one thing and another guild focuses on another? Uh, you have a rune for uh, lightning on your on your arm, right? Or a lightning bolt, but then the the the, the tattoo fades until uh, enough mana seeps back in that the the tattoo uh, you know gradually fades back in again, right? Um, I'm thinking stuff like that. I'm, I'm thinking a defensive tattoo where the tattoos actually move around on the skin and are are, are activated when you try to say mind control a person right stuff like that well i mean or you that, can be, that's, you can have fun with it you can be cinematic well you can but i, I what i'm getting at is more the fundamental question of i want to get into the details of this civilization i want to know what guild a has their power what guild b has their power and what does a want from b and what does b want from a and what do they want from c that's the, those are the details that I really want to get into. Well, that, that's kind of stage two. Stage one, I think you have to have sort of a premise for what's the underlying basis for the magic system, which is essentially what I've provided. Exactly. Stage, I think we're ready for stage, stage two. two. I think is is more about um, how is it actually used? What are the trade offs? How do you set it up so it's balanced? In other words, if you have the right rune, does that mean you rule the world? That doesn't seem good. Nope. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, also the skills that it grants you and uh, how it would work. Because I mean, having spells that do unique things, that would be cool. Did you ever see a TV series called The Lost Room? Mm-hmm. It was awesome. Yeah, it was really awesome. And that hat was full of magic, and the magic was associated with um, relics or artifacts that were in this hotel room. Uh, things like um, a, a normal pocket comb. You brush it through your hair and time stops for 15 seconds. And you can go and do anything during that duration, and um, it seems like a little frivolous power ma magic to begin with until you're at a bank um and it's really interesting the different artifacts one was a bus ticket that if you touch somebody with it they'd end up in the middle of oklahoma oh and nice well the, the premise of the story or at least one of the theories was that every artifact in this hotel room became magical because this was the hotel room where god died um, right. It is that, a really great mini series. Dave just gave more spoilers than I would give. <laughs> Sorry. If you haven't seen it, you really should find it streaming. It sounds somewhere. cool. It's on Link in the description. It's on Prime. It's available for free. Yeah. So you're saying that like God didn't die on the cross? He died in the hotel room? It's just one theory in the in the. Series. Yeah, it's a theory. Oh. There's a lot of theories associated with it. And um, this may be more Yahweh than Jesus, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, yeah, what I liked about it, I, what I liked about it was they weren't ancient relics, you know, a lot of times with magic systems, it's always yeah, yeah. that sure. you know, thing that came from Atlantis that yeah. was uh, you know, the little monolith that had scribed on it or whatever. Um, in this, it was a pack of cigarettes, a pocket watch, a pair of glasses, mm -hmm. pocket comb, um, right. an artificial eye, which was the creepiest one of all. Nice. Yeah, and, and nobody knew what the effects were. Right. Yeah, and they would experiment to see, okay, what does this thing do? And right. a lot of those experiments did not end well. <laughs> and what I like potentially with the rune thing is like, you okay? You, you found these runes. Maybe you got all of it deciphered properly, and now you're going to try it out. Oops! <laughs> it looks like you blew up the village. I guess that one didn't work. Nope. <laughs> Did you know that uh, Vikings actually believed that runes were magic? Hmm. Because 
you'd have a bunch of runes written down in a book. And if you understood them, you could just simply look at a book and suddenly know how to forge steel. That wow. seems pretty magic to me. That is pretty magic. Or you could be spoken to from your ancestors. You know, it's, uh, I love the idea of runes and magic. Uh, there is kind of a magic to it in that the, I could read a book and understand what Julius Caesar was thinking 2,000 years ago when he was fighting in Gaul. That's yeah, that's it's magic, right. man. It You're totally right. is. It is magic. And you know what else is magic? How long this episode has gotten to. So <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yeah, well, I mean, uh, it's there is a lot of things that you can learn on magic. And you haven't Turning even my face red is magic. Yeah. 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 Boom. Pop a smurf. That's magic. They did have magic in this place. <laughs> and Smurfs um, were blue. Um, Jeffrey just said. Yeah, well, Papa Smurf was, you know, he had red clothes. I mean, uh, <laughs> anyway, I think, yeah. it was a fun episode. We, we have, guys, we've given a really good magic system here. I, I, David, you gave us some really good suggestions. I do look forward to what we consider for the actual guilds and what they actually specialize in, which we will have to leave to an exercise for the viewer. Until next time, this is another finely structured episode, everyone. Thank you so much for coming.